that in this space a week ago there were 31 graduates from Cambridge's Academy's GED program. These graduates are people who've been working in our fields, go to school at night to get their GED. And they celebrated that in this space. This past week 122 families drove through our parking lot and received the gift of food. As Grocery Outlet did their um, grand opening, they presented our food pantry with a check for $500 to help pay for the gas that's required as Ray goes around and picks up all the food that's donated. And at the same time, they agreed to partner with us to give us the overflow of their food. So I want you to take a minute. Think about your life this week. Where did he show up? Might have been in just that fresh cup of coffee on that morning when you're looking out. It's a beautiful day. Maybe it was just that. Maybe it was just getting all those puppies 
off the back porch at the Stinnett's house. Think for a minute. Where did he show up for you? And I will give day that you blessed us with. Oh Lord, we thank you for the, the many, many, many ways that you show up in our life each and every day, whether it's in us or it's around us, and you show up as you do things through us into the lives of others. We thank you for the way in which you provide for us. We thank you for the many ways in which you watch over and guard and protect us and run before us at all times. We thank you for the gift of your peace and the gift of your mercy and the gift of your grace. Lord, in the midst of being grateful to you, we do live in a fallen world and things happen. Things happen. Oh, Lord, I want to lift up um, those on Maui, in Maui, that are struggling with the loss of everything. Everything in this world that they have, they lost in a moment. So much goes with that, so much grief, so much loss. We, thank, we pray for the families that are um, grieving because they literally lost not only their stuff, but they lost family members. Unexpectedly, a family member's gone, died. So we pray, Lord, that you would be with all of them, that you would comfort them as they mourn and grieve. We see numbers, but behind each number is a real person and a real family. Lord, we pray, pray for healing and restoration that um, you would begin already the rebuilding process and I pray that you would provide all of those people with everything that they need. Provide the helpers with everything that they need so they can help in even, in even bigger and better ways. Oh Lord, we also want to recognize the fact that this isn't the only place in the world right now that's struggling and you know all of it. So I pray that through the goodness of your people that are scattered throughout the world, that, that you would bring comfort, that you would bring peace, that you would bring provision. And we know that you're doing that and will continue to do that. And in that, we give thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You can have a, have a seat. Um, thank you for being here. Um, welcome to the gathering. We, we call this the gathering because God calls us to gather as his people. 
uh, not only just as a church, but to gather as, as followers. Jesus wanted us to be together. And that was always the first response um, to being around Jesus was people wanting to gather around. So we gather in this space because we believe something. We share something in common. And hopefully if you're visiting with us or you're new in here, you, you see that in us, this heart. But we believe honestly that following Jesus is the best way to live. It really is the best way to live. Uh, it impacts us in here. It doesn't change the circumstances out here, but it impacts us in here and how we navigate through life. Um, we believe that learning how to live and love like Jesus out in the world is what makes the difference, and we're called to do that. Um, so as followers of Jesus, we want to learn how to live and love like him, and we do that together. Um, and we're learning how to do that. And this is one of those moments where we get to reflect, we get to celebrate, we get to be reminded. And my hope is that we realign our hearts with God's heart because Jesus' heart is God's heart. And that helps us make a difference in our world. Not only in our world, but in our world around us that's so desperate for Jesus. So desperate for Jesus. Um, some logistical things in our time together this morning. Our bathrooms are still under construction, so if you have to go potty. You can go down that hallway all the way to the end, or you can go down this hallway all the way to the end, and those, those work fine. They're just single bathrooms, and those will be done um, soon. Um, we have a prayer wall in the back. We have a prayer station. I see all the candles are actually lit on that already. Please feel free to go back there at any time um, and uh, use those. There, there's prompts to guide you in that. We have a gratitude wall over there, uh, trellis actually. And it's um, prompted as well, so you can just read it, and you just take a tag and write something on it. I encourage you to do that today. Please feel free at any time. Uh, we don't pass an offering. We believe our offering is an act of worship, and it's prompted by us personally giving back to God, um, saying thank you, Lord, honoring the fact that he provides us with everything that we need, and there's envelopes back there for your convenience. So um, if you feel compelled to do that, or this is your church, um, please take advantage of that and I think that's all I wanted to say to get us ready it's a little warm in here isn't it yes we need a fresh wind of the spirit I will give you a little tip kind of where Amy raise your hand Amy where she's kind of sitting and then um, and then right in front of Liz and right where LT is see those vents up there the coolest spots in the room are those spots. So that's where the cold air goes first. So if you want to be best friends with LT and Amy, now might be the time to do it. Okay. So let me pray and um, we'll continue to worship. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are grateful. Oh Lord, we're grateful for your faithfulness that you are always good. You are always good. We thank you for that. We thank you that your mercy, your mercy is always present and it's never failing. We thank you for the way in which your goodness always is running after us and running before us. And for that, we're grateful. Lord, we thank you for the way in which you provide in our lives. And so, Lord, I ask that you would take our tithes and offerings this morning and that you would bless them and multiply them so that you can continue to use us in this community to be a blessing. And uh, we thank you for those gifts that will be given today. And, Lord, I do pray for all the prayers that will be written on papers, the prayer candles back there. Lord, I pray that you would really hear those prayers, and we know you do. Um, but I, I just ask a special prayer this morning that you would really honor those. Um, we come to you in the name of Jesus and ask that you would do that. So, Lord, as we continue to sing, Lord, we want it to um, remind us of you and help us to proclaim these truths not only with our mouths but with our hearts that we might know that, that there's something that we actually believe. In Jesus' name, amen.
all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's sing that again. All my life you have been have been so, so 
thank you for the reminder that you're always at work. And Lord, oftentimes we can't even see it. And we're hoping that you'll start to do something. You'll start to do something. We have things going on in our lives and we want you to do something. And we want it to happen now. And we're looking and looking and looking and, and seeming like we're not finding it. it yet, Lord, I, I thank you for the reminder that, no, you're always at work, even when we can't see it, and even when we can't feel it, and even in the midst of those feelings that we have where we're suffering and we're struggling and everything, you are at work, and at some point, we're going to see that promise of that miracle. It says in your word that you take everything and you turn it into good. And Lord, we put our hope in that. We put our hope in that. So Lord, everything that's weighing on us, even in this moment right now, Lord, I pray that we would trust you with it and acknowledge the fact that yes, you are at work and you're a miracle worker and you keep your promises. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we value relationships here. And so we're going to do something right now. I'm going to ask you to get up and go to somebody who's not you and go to somebody who's not the people that you always go to. So go to somebody younger, older, someone that you don't know. Introduce yourself and then literally share something that brought you joy this last week. Ready, set, go. All right, let's start heading back to our seats, or you can sit, you can sit with uh, the person you're talking to. You can actually move around.
And then Kristen's going to come up and do our announcements this morning. Some of you may have remembered um, Jen, our friend Jennifer, who was one of our neighbors without homes on the street. And uh, God helped turn her life around. And she, um, she's reconciled with her father and has got a whole life going on working for U.S. Postal Service. And she texted Betsy this morning because she's found a church to go up to, um, up where she lives now. And um, she said, oh my gosh, every time I go into church now, I have a seat where I sit. And I'm being reminded that Peter said I should sit somewhere else. So I just throw that out there. Say what? Okay, good morning, everybody. I hope that you all had a fantastic week and that you're having a happy Sunday. It seems like you are. Good morning, Jay. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I know, I know, it's great. Um, okay. So this morning, a few announcements. Um, if you're visiting for the first time or have yet to fill one out, at the bottom of your handout, which I don't have to show you, um, if you'd fill out the connection card, drop it in the giving boxes. That way we know who you are, how we can be praying for you, and if you would like to volunteer in any of the areas that we serve, that would be amazing. Um, but anytime, if you feel like you just need some extra prayer or you just want to put a little message on there, those... Um, Communication cards are always welcome in our giving boxes. Um, let's see, next week, next Sunday is Volunteer Sunday. So we're going to celebrate everybody that's been helping out in all of the various behind-the-scenes capacities. So, yes, we're so grateful for all of our volunteers, and we want to make sure that we're honoring you guys next week. Next week is also... Um, Food and Friends. I was going to say go to lunch. I knew that was wrong. Um, <laughs> next week, Food and Friends Sunday. So after the service, we will be having lunch in the back. So come celebrate volunteers and then join us in the back for lunch afterwards. Um, and then our next training, Catalyst training, is coming up on August 27th. And um, this one we would love for as many of you to be at as possible. I'm going to start passing this around on this side. So if you didn't sign up last week and want to just throw your name on the list, that would be helpful so we know how many we have coming. Um, this will be a really great training for everybody to just kind of, one, get to know each other a little bit more. It's a shared experience, but also to um, really start to get in tune with our individual gifting because that will help us when, if you're kind of like, I want to serve, but I don't know where, or I'm not sure how. Um, just understanding your unique design and gifting will help you kind of narrow that down. And you can always volunteer to serve somewhere, and then if it doesn't work out, try something else. Just, you know, give it a try. But anyway, if you'd like to join us for the training, go ahead and put your name on the list if it's not on there. And then Church Without Walls Food Pantry, um, we're always needing extra donations, and we've moved away from peanut butter and jelly for the time being. Um, <laughs> yes. So next week, you guys can bring canned chicken or tuna, which canned chicken, I know it sounds weird, but there's amazing things that you can do with that. So people would love to have canned chicken and tuna in their pantries. So please bring some of that. You can drop it on the cart as you enter. And Betsy, are you coming up? Okay, Betsy is coming up for the kids. Yay. Did I miss something? Okay, okay gathering kids. Oh, there aren't any. <laughs> but but they, I, most of our students started school last week. So I'm going to pray for all of our students, even though they're not in our presence at the moment. All right, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the kids in Patterson that all went back to school this week. I pray, Lord, that all their nerves have been calmed and um, that they're going to look forward to going back to school tomorrow. And I pray for that you would guard and protect their hearts um, as they are in and amongst new friends and old friends and um, lots of things going on. So 
you are taking care of us, and we know you're going to take care of our kids too. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Give Betsy a hand. Yay, Betsy. All right. I'm feeling um, led to continue praying for kids here for a moment. Let me say why. Um, there are startling statistics uh, in the life of the church that um, families in consistency, um, people with kids coming to church, um, it, it, the numbers of families bringing their children to church is just declining everywhere, everywhere. And um, I posted something on Facebook. I'm actually trying to stay off Facebook now, but I posted something on there. Kristen and I talked about this, and it said families um, who come inconsistently to church, their kids will never come to church. And, um, and so we're kind of seeing the fruit of that where families don't really come, therefore their kids don't know, and their kids will never come. And um, this town is filled with children. You've heard me put the statistics out. And you need to know this is epidemic across the church, even in our community here. Um, where the most children are, are at the Baptist church down the street here, and I praise God for that. But all those families are friends. There's a whole bunch of families on one street in town that are friends, and they're raising their kids together in the ways of Jesus, and that's why they're all there. But for the size of our town, they're just not here. And we need to pray for a movement of the Holy Spirit. I know it sounds weird because we don't use that language very much, but we're ready for them here. And um, I'm hoping that God will give us opportunities to invite families with kids because it's just not, you can just see it's not a, you know, if there's something else going on, we go do the something else that's going on. And kids are learning that if something else is going on, that's priority over this. And I even start to sound legalistic, like you ought to be in church. And that's how far we've, we've, move this other direction. So can you just pray with me that, um, that that would happen? So let's just take a minute and pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, I want to lift up the kids in our town. I get to work with a lot of them at the high school. We see them all over the place. There's a whole bunch of kids on my own street. Um, Lord, I know your desire is that they would come to know Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray for a movement of your spirit in this town and in this community and in families that they would seek after you. They're looking for everything in the world to give them everything that they're looking for and yet they will discover down the road that somehow that was empty, that somehow that was, there was something missing and that's you and that's Jesus. And so, Lord, as I look at it, it's overwhelming, but I know it's not overwhelming to you. So, Lord, I pray that you would send us families with children that we can love and grow with. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So it says in scripture that we have been blessed to be a blessing, and Jesus said we're supposed to love our neighbor, and the way in which we bless is we love our neighbor, and we bless by praying for them. We begin just praying for the people that God has placed around our lives, the people that live around us where we live, the people we work with, the people that are constants in our lives. Those are our neighbors. Sometimes it's literal, but sometimes it's just the people that we're in proximity with. And we just pray for them daily, that God's grace would be at work in their life and that there'd be um, provision. Everything that they need would be provided. And then as we pray for them, we take the opportunity to get to, get to know them a little bit, listen, and we can pray more effectively as we pray for them. And then the gift of food that we have, we can always invite people into the gift of food. And as we do that, we also look for opportunities to serve those that we're praying for, knowing that at some point we're going to have relationships with them, closer relationships with them, and then when something happens, they will seek after us, and then we can share the Jesus that's in our life. We can share those Jesus things with them that they might find the hope uh, that we have. We have bracelets that we wear to remind us. I have more up here if you need a new one or you don't have one. Um, but uh, we're going to take a moment to pray for, for our neighbors. But I do want to say this, and this is not a church event, um, but you're all invited. Um, this blessed concept, I have a barbecue at my house every summer called Smoking Hot Pool Party. And um, I invite all my friends and neighbors, all of my worlds into one place in the hopes that eventually people begin to connect the dots and realize, wait a minute, 
you're, beca- you're here because of Peter and Betsy, some connection to them. And then I always find in those conversations that Jesus starts to come up because that's the common thread. So it's this Saturday, all day, I smoke meat, bring aside. Um, you're welcome to come. And for me, that's blessed because all my neighbors come to enjoy the gift of food, which is my love language. So let's take a minute and pray for our neighbors. If you don't know what to pray, just pray that God's grace would be at work in their lives and that he would meet their every need. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of relationships. Thank you for those that you've placed in and around our lives that we get to do life with daily. And Lord, we do pray that your grace would be at work in their lives, that you would meet their every need. And Lord, um, I lift up all of the names that were prayed in here and entrust them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you've got a Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 20. We're going to finish the Gospel of John next week. Um, but we're going to be in chapter 20 today. Um, if you are pulling it up on your phone and you want to know what translation I'm reading from, um, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. That's what I use. Study with a lot of other ones, but that's the one I like to use when we're together. So, um, gosh, 20, gosh, 23 years ago, um, Betsy and I started a church in Brentwood. And uh, a guy kind of wandered in and became uh, a part of our church. And I'm going to leave his name anonymous because I didn't ask permission to tell this story. Um, But anyway, he came in and he was just getting off drugs and stuff. And he was going to NA and AA meetings, everything, every meeting he could get to. And he was going through the ups and downs. And he was in his 40s. And he had such a tender sweetheart. And I watched him struggle just daily, weekly, monthly, and he'd have seasons where he was doing well, and then he would crash and burn. He'd have seasons where he was doing well, and he would crash and burn. And um, as I got to know him, I discovered, gosh, there's so many stories that happened in his life. And unfortunately, he had a certain way that he would respond every time any of these emotions and feelings came up. He would always respond. He would go to the things that brought him comfort, which were drugs. And I totally understood it. So one day we're hanging out, and I'm, I'm, I go, dude, tell me some of the stories. And he, he entrusted me with this one story that explained a lot about what his life was about. So he's 10 years old, and um, he's living at home with his father, who is a violent alcoholic. Okay? And so this guy daily is getting verbally abused and physically abused by his father. It doesn't matter what he does. It never measures up. He's getting beat up all of the time, and he's not feeling loved in any way, shape, or form. So you can imagine as a, as a boy growing up in that, what that's doing to him. And uh, a person down the street um, happened to have some puppies, and uh, he asked his dad if he could get a puppy. And the dad said, you know, in a very mean, grouchy way, yes, but you, I better not, you better, you know. So he gets this dog, and this dog brings love into his life. He feeds it, he takes care of it, sleeps with him and everything. All of a sudden, this, this love that he has, or the desire for, is there, present in this puppy. But this puppy has a problem. The puppy barks. So one evening, his dad's in his one of his worst moments, and the dog starts barking. And he's yelling at the dog to shut up. He's yelling at this guy to get that dog to be quiet. And he couldn't get the dog quiet. And before he could, like, put him on a leash and go somewhere else, the dad comes out with a gun. Boom! Boom!
takes that dog, goes out on the back part of the property and buries his dog. And goes to bed that night. So I want you to think for a minute all the emotions and feelings that he's feeling in that moment. Next morning he wakes up. His dad never wakes up early because he always passes out. He hears a scratch at the door. He's like, what the heck? And he goes to the door and he opens up the door and there's his dog standing in front of him, blood, covered in dirt. It turns out that the bullet grazed him and knocked him out. And fortunately, he was buried not too deep, so he dug himself out and basically came back to life. Now, that was a redeeming moment in this guy's life, and it was, it was that kind of thing that you know, for the rest of his life, no matter how many times things just didn't go right, this guy held on to a little bit of hope. A little bit of hope all the time because he remembered that. And that dog eventually passed away. But something happened in that moment for him that even amidst life's struggle, he always had hope. He knew that somehow God would redeem and fix something that was wrong. So we're in this series um, called Go Do Be, Living a Jesus-Shaped Life. And... We're in the Gospel of John because John's heart is that we would know Jesus, we'd fall in love with Jesus, we would follow him and recognize everything that John recognized that Jesus did in his life and the difference that it made. So I want to say this to us this morning. When we encounter anything that is, has, or will take something in life that we value away, when Jesus is present, we will have peace. Because everything is and can and will be redeemed, resurrected, made new, now, and here's the key, or in the life to come. We need to know that. We need to be able to put our hope in that. And that's what guides us through grief, fear, doubt, anything that's going on in our lives is that hope that it can be redeemed and be resurrected and made new. So we're going to take a look at this passage. And I'm going to read the whole chapter 20. And as I read it, I want you to listen to it. I want you to imagine the feelings you just had when I talked about that whole dog thing in the context of the disciples, in the context of Jesus. And I believe this is going to speak to you. I'm going to share some stuff afterwards, but I believe this speaks. So, um, last week we left off. Jesus died. He was placed in a tomb before Sabbath. And Jewish people couldn't do anything on Sabbath, and it was going into Passover. And so Jesus was laid in a tomb. And we know that the Romans rolled a stone in front of it and put guards on it so that nobody would steal Jesus' body, which was common back then. So here we go. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, whoever he is, the one whom Jesus loved. Ah, it's John. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Think about it. Jesus died, he was buried, and she goes, and it says that the ladies went there to basically prepare him for more burial, final burial, so that they could go through the whole grieving process that was coming, and she goes there, and he's gone. His body's been taken. That's what's running through her head, because it was common back then. His body was stolen. 
Talk about grief upon grief. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived, and he went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, and while the cloth had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said, Jesus must rise from the dead, and they went home. Jesus had told them this was going to happen. It was prophesied. They all knew it. This was supposed to happen. But it's interesting. They didn't believe it. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying, the angels asked. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they've put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying, Jesus asked her. Why, who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus shouted. She turned to him and cried out, Rabbanai, which means Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said. She immediately grabbed him and clung to him. For I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers, and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father, and your Father to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I've seen the Lord. And then she gave him his message. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sin, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later. So Thomas is living with that doubt. Eight days later, the disciples were together and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing amongst them. Peace be with you, he said. And then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wounds in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. Um, Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to receive that which you have for us this morning. And I pray that what I share this morning is helpful, truthful, and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul wrote these words in a letter he wrote to a church in Philippi. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. John wants us to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Basics. Jesus died for the forgiveness of everything. Everything in the world, everything you and I will ever experience, everything that gets in the way of our relationships with ourselves, our relationship with God, our relationship with others, Jesus died and paid the penalty for all time. With his death, 
but it wasn't just his death. It was his victory over death, which means there's always victory. There's always victory. That's just the basics of the idea of what resurrection. If Jesus had not risen from the dead, he was just another guy who was amazing and loving and caring and rattled the world, dead, gone. But that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. Here's some great quotes on the resurrection that I just want to share with you. Tim Keller wrote this. Some of you know who he is. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. Think of all the things he said. I mean, if he rose from the dead, he's the real deal. We need to accept everything that he said. Robert Flatt, these are the quotes on your handout today. The resurrection gives my life meaning and direction and the opportunity to start over no matter what my circumstances are. Josh McDowell, who some of us have been in the church a long time know who this is. No matter how devastating our struggles, disappointments, and troubles are, they're only temporary. No matter what happens to you, no matter the depth of tragedy or pain you face, no matter how death stalks you and your loved ones, the resurrection promises you a future of immeasurable good. John Piper, who just passed away recently, the best news, no, not John Piper, Keller passed away recently. The best news of the Christian gospel is that the supremely glorious creator of the universe has acted in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection to remove every obstacle between us and himself so that we might find everlasting joy. N.T. Wright, who's a favorite of mine, says, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project. And lastly, Richard Rohr. What the resurrection is saying more than anything else is that love is stronger than death. Jesus walked through both life and death with love, which becomes an infinite life, a participation in God himself. Surprise of surprises. This cannot be proven logically or rationally, and yet this is the mystery that we now stake our life, our death on. Nothing dies forever, and all that has died in love will be reborn in an even larger love. You need to know at the time of Jesus, the Jews, they believed in resurrection. They believed that down the road, everybody would be resurrected who followed the law. You'd be resurrected and you'd be united in a relationship, an eternal relationship with God. But it was a, a resurrection to come. It wasn't going to happen now. It was a resurrection that was to come. And so the disciples, they had a hard time believing it because everything they'd been taught, and it experienced and known throughout their life wasn't that. So when Jesus is saying, I'm going to come back in three days, it's going over their head because that's not what they know. That's not what they know. And even though they had followed Jesus and seen all of the things that he did, it didn't get in there that this could actually happen. And we know that because the women came prepared to make his burial more extensive we know that the disciples, if you read further in the other Gospels, that they just went back to their old jobs. They just went back to life because Jesus is gone. And there's no way he's coming back. And yet he did. Yet he did. So when I read through this text this week, I was looking at these three situations. Mary, the disciples, and Thomas. And their response. And it's crazy because I saw my life in their responses. Just look at Mary. Her first response was grief and sorrow. I mean, she immediately went to the ground, man. She's crying. Oh, my gosh. It was bad. Now it's worse. <laughs> Anybody ever have that? It's bad. Now it's worse. And she's on the ground weeping. And Jesus is right there with her. And she doesn't even see it. Or hear it. She thinks she's talking to somebody else. But she, when she recognizes the presence of Jesus, it changes everything. And you hear the word joy show back up in her life. Then you have the other disciples. Peter, the slower disciple, and John, the faster runner. 
John recognizes it. He's like, oh my gosh, Jesus said this was going to happen. Peter doesn't. They're back where they live with the door locked, hiding in fear because they're concerned now that people are going to think that they stole Jesus' body and they're going to get in deeper trouble. So even in the tension of, did this really happen? Didn't this happen? All they're concerned with is, oh my gosh, bigger consequences. And they're hiding in fear. They're hiding in fear. And then Jesus shows up. And the fear goes away. In fact, he empowers them, says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. You get to go and do big things. You're going to get to go forgive people. You get to go forgive people just as I did with my whole life. And then we have Thomas. Poor guy. He's not there in the moment where Jesus shows up. And his first response is doubt. I can't believe it. You're all experiencing all this in your life. I'm not. I don't believe it. And until this, I won't believe it. And I love it in the midst of his doubt. Jesus shows up in the midst of his doubt. Reveals himself to to Thomas. And gives Thomas what he needs so that he can believe. And move forward. I don't know if you noticed in this text, but one of the things that kept coming up was this idea of peace. Each time Jesus walked into these moments, he said, peace be with you. Now, we know, we've talked about this word here, and some of you even tell me this word as you leave here. You'll go, shalom, Peter, shalom. And that basically means all is right, all is good, all is well. There's nothing wrong in your life, and I wish that blessing on you. And Jewish people did that as a hi and hello. And a goodbye. In Hawaiian, what is it? Aloha. So those words, shalom, I think when you hear them all the time, they kind of lose the weight, right? It's like we say, hi Alta, how's it going? And you say, fine. And That's good. And we go on, right? It kind of loses. In this moment, Jesus is saying shalom. All is well. All is right. All is good. In the midst of terrible circumstances. Right? He is showing up and he's saying peace be with you. Peace be with you. Our first response in situations isn't peace. Anybody, when things happen that you don't expect that aren't right, is that where we go? I'm at peace. All is good. It's good. So I'll I'll share with you what steals my peace. So I love people. I don't know if you know that. I care deeply about relationships. I care deeply about relationships. Therefore, I hate conflict. So the minute there's a conflict in the life of someone that I care deeply about and value that relationship, there's conflict with me in that relationship. It robs me of peace. I can't sleep, I can't eat, and I love to eat. I can't eat. I can't do anything. I'm paralyzed by it. I'm sick to my stomach. I hate conflict in relationships. But this is why. My first response, and I don't know where it comes from, and I'm still working on it. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? And is this even fixable? And it eats at me. It robs me of my peace. And I know that God can be there in the midst of it. I know that God can go before it. I know that there's great conversations that can happen. I know that God can redeem that relationship. And if it isn't redeemed, it'll be 
redeemed later. But my first response is, Peter, what did you do wrong to cause this? And I stew in it. And I'm afraid of losing that relationship. I'm angry at myself. I'm grieving. You, you name it, it's right there. And my desire is that I would be able to have hope at all times in those moments that God will redeem those relationships and that he's probably, well, I know he is, he's already at work right now. And what I'm doing in the midst of it is I'm making a lot of assumptions. I'm assuming all is going to go bad and I'm going to lose that relationship. And Betsy will tell you, 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. So this idea of peace. Jesus said these words. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. He goes on later to say, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Meaning take heart. It's going to be fixed. It's going to be redeemed. I'm going to resurrect it. I'm going to make it new. All will be well. Now or in the life to come. Everything will be resurrected and be made new. Jesus' presence always replaces grief and fear and doubt because he brings peace. Jesus was that. Jesus just being himself, wherever he showed up, he was the prince of peace. He really was. He would go into any situation that was going on in somebody's life and he could redeem it and make it well. And he didn't do it to everybody. When he went into the crowds, he didn't do it to everybody, but he did it to a few and in those few lives, it gave everybody else hope because Jesus knew at some point his father would redeem and resurrect and make everything else new. So I don't know if you guys know this, kind of a last thought. Psychologists have figured out that the way in which we respond is the way in which we respond. All the time. The way we live and respond to life literally forms pathways of response in our life. These are our go-tos. In other words, when something happens in a relationship like I shared with you about me, I immediately assume I did something wrong and I'm afraid of losing the relationship. That's where my brain goes every time. To the point I'm afraid to look at my phone afraid to look at my texts, afraid to look at my phone messages for fear of what that would be. That's where my brain automatically goes. What God would want us to do, what Jesus would want us to do, you all have pathways that you respond and react to everything. He would want us to make new ones. He would want us to make new ones so that we can find peace. So this is how I'm doing it. Jesus shows up and there's peace, right? The presence of Jesus brings peace. So when I have those moments that are creating all of my feelings and emotions from whatever the circumstances, where is Jesus right now? In this. Where is Jesus right now in this? In my daughter's divorce right now that is heavy and hard, where is Jesus in this? You guys all know my grandson Gabriel is getting help right now for stuff that's going on in his life. Where is Jesus in this? Just asking that question changes it. My pathway is different. Because guess what? He is working. He is there in it. And it will be redeemed and resurrected and be made new. It will be brought back to life. Maybe not on our timeline, but it will happen. And our assumptions that it won't rob us of peace. 
because our assumptions are wrong. My mom's dying of dementia. I got a call the other day that someone came into her room and drug her out of bed and beat her up, another person with dementia, and she was in the hospital. Okay? Now, I can get all in a... I want my mom to go home to be with Jesus. And I hate the condition that she's in right now because she might have been, she might have even instigated the fight. I don't know. Who knows? Um, But I know... She's going to be my mom again. She's going to get a new body. She's going to be clear. She's going to be healthy. This is temporary. It is temporary. God will redeem all of it. But we have to retrain the way we think. So I want us to do something. It's one thing to talk about it. I want you to think about something in your life right now that is not right. You're losing sleep over it. You're frustrated with it. You wish it was better. You wish it was fixed. You wish it was right. I want you to think about in your life right now, and some of you have more things than others. If you can't think of one, think of someone else who when you're looking at your life, their life, you're you're seeing things and it's causing you to not have peace. Just think of one. I want you to close your eyes. Look for Jesus in it. Just take a minute and see if you can see where Jesus might be in it. Jesus said these words, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. I want you to believe that he's there. And I'm going to read a prayer that I've been using. And, um, You can just listen to it, or you can recite it in your head. Jesus, I come in the midst of my daughter's circumstances. I invite you into the middle of it. I surrender all my thoughts. I surrender all my emotions to you and ask for your peace. Help me to believe in the midst of my unbelief that you will redeem and resurrect it into all that I'm hoping for. Give me the patience to live knowing it will come. Help me to believe resurrection is coming for this in my life. Help me to look for you And find your peace. It's promised in scripture that we will experience a peace that goes beyond our understanding. And that is my prayer for you and for me.
so um, as we go to communion, it's all about this. So Patsy, would you mind helping serve communion this morning? And <coughs> Kathy, would you mind helping? No? Okay. Millie, would you? I'm just going to hit the family one. Okay, so as we come up um, this morning to take communion, just be reminded that, that Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he said, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take, eat, and drink, and do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. My body broken for you, my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Until, Paul says, until Jesus returns, which means all the good's coming, all the good's coming, everything we hope for, it's coming, so as you take communion today, just be reminded of his peace, and that good is coming, good is coming, let me pray, Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for the gift of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, um, Lord, I do thank you that you are always at work, we live in a world that's filled with all kinds of troubles, it really is, but um, you can bring peace into our lives right now in a way that the world can't. And so I pray, Lord, as we take um, this bread and dip it in the cup and eat it, Lord, that, um, that we would be reminded of your love for us and the peace that you can give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Come whenever you're ready. We just take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and eat. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. Came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. Came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Make me your vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever 
you want me to be came here with nothing but all you have given me jesus bring new wine out of me jesus bring new wine out of me jesus bring new wine out of me amen all right let me bless us as we go and uh, we can go off into the midst of our day um yeah uh, heavenly father oh lord i want to pray a special blessing on everyone in this room uh, you know what's going on in each of their hearts uh, Lord, where there is no peace, I pray that there would be peace. Where there is no hope, I pray that there would be hope. Where there is fear, I pray that there would be no fear. Where there is grief, I pray for comfort. Where there's anger, I pray for peace. Lord, may you watch over and guard and protect our hearts. And as we leave this place, may we know that your spirit is present in us and that when we walk, every step we take, that Jesus is present. Help us in every moment, in every circumstance, to turn our eyes and look to see Jesus in the midst of every moment of our life. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, feel free to hang out. No hurry. Niner games at 1.